definitely recorded. <laughs> um, but it's my great pleasure to actually, uh, before I welcome you and introduce the panel, to introduce the Dean of the Elliott School, Alyssa Ayers, who has some welcoming comments for us this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Ben, and welcome everyone. Thanks for being able to join us today for what I think will be a sober and thoughtful uh, reflection on what's taken place over the course of the last year since the fall of Kabul. Uh, it has not been a, a story with a, an outcome that anybody would have hoped for, and I think we'll hear from our speakers today uh, who have a perspective uh, directly linked to what happened uh, one year ago the end of the collapse of the former government of Afghanistan, and they'll be able to give us some more insights from how uh, the governance questions that many have wondered about uh, have, have come to the fore, how the Taliban is uh, ruling Afghanistan, what has happened for the Indian girls, from our speakers. Um, this is, of course, also one day after the uh, anniversary of 9-11. We all have much on our minds to reflect on. Uh, let me welcome you all to this conversation. Uh, and I will now turn things back to uh, Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of History and International Affairs, Ben Hopkins, who will introduce each of our speakers uh, and get the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, have introduced myself to begin with. Uh, my name is Benjamin Hopkins. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Elliott School. I'm also, uh, in my spare time, a historian of modern Afghanistan. So this particular topic is near to my heart. Um, we have an outstanding panel today that really does uh, span the breadth of experience, uh, both professional and personal. Um, we're going to hear from some Afghans themselves today. We'll also have both uh, policy and professional uh, positions here in Washington, as well as those working with Afghan refugees here in the United States. Um, as a historian, one of the things I always try to correct a great misunderstanding with my students is that our interest is not in events, but in processes. And when we talk about the fall of Kabul a year ago, we're not so much talking about an event that is over, but a process that is still playing out. Indeed, yesterday marked the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, which a month later led to the American invasion of Afghanistan. Just a month shy of 20 years after that invasion, the U.S. withdrew from the country in a spectacularly shambolic and chaotic form, leading to the return to power of the Taliban after a 20-year interval. Despite the subsequent silence of the American political class, and the seeming disinterest of the American electorate, that withdrawal marked the end of neither the still ongoing global war on terror nor the suffering of the people of Afghanistan. Thousands of Afghans remain in limbo around the world, waiting in camps for possible resettlement in the US or other Western countries, which in truth may never come. Millions in Afghanistan are themselves trapped by a repressive regime whose interests and abilities to govern are limited at best. Their situation is compounded by an international community which has largely washed its proverbial hands of the issue. Today's panel, including the voices of both Afghans and those who have and continue to work with them, will provide insight into the ongoing process of the fall of Kabul, giving their experiences and professional insight, as well as considering the still accumulating costs of the war, which most Americans would like to forget. On today's panel, we are joined by Chris Omara Vignaraja, who unfortunately is not able to be here in person. Chris, we hope you are feeling better, uh, but we're glad to have you uh, here with us today. Chris is the president and CEO of the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, she previously served the Obama White House as policy director for First Lady Michelle Obama and at the State Department as senior advisor under Se uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Secretary of State John Kerry. While in government, she worked on multiple issues and programs, including those concerning refugees and migration, engagement with religious communities, the legal dimensions of U.S. foreign policy, 
and regional issues relating to Africa and the Middle East. A graduate of Yale University, from which she has a BSc, an MA, and a JD. She was also a Marshall Scholar uh, at Oxford University, where she received an MPhil in international relations. Second, we have to my left, Sadiq Amin, who is a program manager for outreach at the Observer Research Foundation America. He previously worked at the United States Embassy in Kabul for almost nine years, where he served as an advisor on the U.S.-Afghanistan bilateral security agreement and as an embassy liaison with the government of Afghanistan. He played a key role in coordinating the evacuation of American citizens, green card holders, and more than 3,000 locally employed staff and their families after the Taliban takeover of Kabul. In recognition of his services, the U.S. Department of State presented him with the Heroism Award. He previously served in various capacities in the Afghan government, including working with the Independent Election Commission in 2010 and with the permanent mission of Afghanistan to the United Nations in New York. And finally, Mukadessa Yurish, a former Deputy Minister for Commerce and Industry of the previous government of Afghanistan, joined the George Washington University community as the Elliott School of International Affairs, J.D. and Maurice C. Shapiro Professor of International Affairs last January. Ms. Yurish has broad government experience, including service as a commissioner on Afghanistan's National Civil Service Reform Commission, and prior to that, as Human Resources Director of the Municipality of Kabul. She was also Country Director for LAPIS, a top strategic communications firm of Mobi Group, giving her private sector experience. Her expertise spans international trade and commerce, governance, economic development and reform, human capital, and strategic communications. And I should also note that both Ms. Yurish and Mr. Amini are Fulbright alumni. Uh, each of our speakers will present for approximately 10 to 15 minutes of opening remarks, after which we'll open it to questions from the floor for what I am sure will be a robust and interesting conversation. So why don't I turn it over to our first speaker who joins us remotely, Krish. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Professor Hopkins. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is really such a pleasure to at least be able to remote in. I am um, dealing with a kindergartner who uh, has turned into a petri dish, so everything she's exposed to, I am. So I'm nursing a cold and wanted to avoid getting anyone else sick. Um, as Professor Hopkins mentioned, my name is Krish Omera Vignaraja. Uh, I serve as president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, um, also known as LIRS. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, um, LIRS is the largest faith-based national nonprofit dedicated to immigrants and refugees. Uh, we're headquartered in Baltimore. Day-to-day, uh, -day, I speak in a number of different settings, but I will tell you, um, and you probably heard it, in my bio, I love school, um, so it's always nice when I get a chance to come back um, to a more academic setting. Um, was able to participate in the What's Next um, in Foreign Affairs speaker series uh, at the Elliott School this past April, and so it's really uh, a wonderful opportunity um, to be able to partici participate in this one-year reflection um, after the fall of Kabul and the evacuation of 80,000 Afghans. So looking back, it was clear to us at LIRS that the Afghan, um, the Afghanistan troop withdrawal would cause a humanitarian crisis. Um, we urged the Biden administration to put forth an evacuation plan that would meet our moral obligation to the Afghans that we promised to protect. Um, tragically, such a plan was not, I mean, well, I should say, such a plan was obviously the right thing to do. Um, it would have provided resettlement. Um, and receiving communities with the opportunity to prepare for what was coming. Um, we advocated for an evacuation model similar to what we've done in past wartime evacuations, including uh, Vietnamese after the fall of Saigon, that would have transported at-risk Afghans to a safe location where their immigration cases could have been processed and they could then you know, apply to visas to enter the U.S. safely through the refugee resettlement system. Unfortunately, the Biden administration chose a different route, which of course led to August 15th, 2021. Um, 
it was a terrifying day that upended the Afghan world, um, separating people from their families and forcing them to flee uh, for their lives with next to nothing. I know my colleagues um, will speak personally um, to that. Uh, like you, um, I think in the audience, so many of us here in the U.S. watched the Taliban take over in shock. Uh, the horrific images from the Kabul airport, um, I know will be seared in our collective memory forever. Um, I'm certainly not a military expert, and so I won't dive into the details of what should have been done or should not have been done in the war in Afghanistan. But you know what I know is that the Biden administration knew that there were tens of thousands of Afghans that would be at risk of retaliation from the Taliban for their support of the U.S. mission or because of their you know, religion, um, profession, sexual orientation, other vulnerabilities, that they would be targeted. Um, although the harried and chaotic evacuation brought many to safety, it left thousands of at-risk Afghans behind. And while there is still much more to do, the evacuation was a historic whole of society effort. Um, a year later, you know, where we are today, there are still Afghans who supported the U.S. mission who are in grave danger, uh, not to mention the thousands in other vulnerable populations, including uh, journalists, women's rights activists, so many others. Many of them protected us, and in turn, we vowed to protect them. So this is where LIRS firmly stands by the view that we have a moral obligation to keep that promise. At this point, due to Taliban control, it has become virtually impossible to evacuate all of our allies. But nevertheless, the Biden administration must do everything in its power to ensure that we save those lives that we can and give them permanent status here in the U.S. And we must also remember that men, women, children are at, rest, are at risk, not only because of the Taliban, but also because the country is at risk of famine. And both the healthcare system and the economy are at risk of collapse. Um, at LRS, we will continue to stand at the ready to welcome every Afghan ally that can reach our shore. Uh, over the past year, LIRS has received an enormous outpouring of support from donors, veterans, folks on both sides of the aisle. Um, and it has been inspiring to see Americans who have stood up and opened their hearts and their communities to those who have given so much to us. Um, so I want to spend a few minutes talking about what Afghan resettlement has looked like here at home. So following the uh, evacuation, LIRS was proud to lead the charge alongside our new Afghan neighbors in advocacy, resettlement, economic empowerment. And while the Afghan resettlement effort has, you know, largely faded from the daily headlines. Um, the truth is our work of welcome continues every day. For resettlement professionals across the country, this mission has been one of the most challenging and meaningful of our careers. We knew that this would not be an easy undertaking, but it was unquestionably made more difficult by four years of cuts to the refugee program under the prior Trump administration, when more than 100 Local resettlement offices uh, representing about a third of the national network were forced to suspend services or um, close altogether. So after those years of you know, dismantlement and downsizing, resettlement agencies have rebuilt, um, even while the historic low of uh, you know, refugees have been admitted to the U.S. And so the crisis in Afghanistan um, certainly push the system to its limits. Um, some resettlement offices who would welcome dozens of refugees in an entire year in 2020 received hundreds of Afghans within a, a matter of a few months um, to suddenly serve seven times the number of refugees we admitted in the entirety of the previous year was obviously a daunting mission. Um, and that's where we looked to this sprint. Um, I still marvel at the way that the LIRS team sprang to action really across the country and mobilized with lightning speed to assist more than 13,500 Afghans 
Um, our team secured temporary then permanent housing for individuals and families, um, which was obviously no small feat. Um, I think as Americans, we know the affordable housing crunch uh, that so many have experienced across the country. We enrolled thousands of children in school, um, help families access community resources. Uh, we've hosted job fairs to help Afghan workers take those first few steps to self-sufficiency. Um, we've organized legal clinics, uh, cultural orientations, um, financial literacy classes, mental health workshops. And so we now have 80,000 Afghan neighbors in communities really across the country. And we know that our nation is stronger for it. They're resilient, driven, talented, they're eager to contribute. Um, and thanks to their arrival, the rebuilding of the resettlement infrastructure has been jump-started. We um, have now seen about 60 uh, new local sites open throughout the country. And then another remarkable effort um, has involved Afghans helping fellow Afghans. And you only need to look uh, not too far from where you are all today to Northern Virginia. We have an office where 100% uh, of our staff are Afghan, uh, many recent arrivals themselves. Obviously the last year has been a traumatic uncertain time and they have weathered it with grace, tenacity, strength. Many of them have spoken publicly about the transformative power of welcoming fellow Afghans to the US and sharing their own experiences with the new arrivals. Um, our Northern office, Northern Virginia office uh, was stood up exclusively to serve Afghans. And I think it's an exemplar of what is possible. Um, you know, with that said, we must continue to advocate for solutions for those who have been resettled under what we call humanitarian parole and other temporary statuses. Um, finding gainful employment, securing permanent status in the US are among the top priorities for our neighbors. Afghan workers face language barriers, lack of public transportation, um, and unfamiliarity with American hiring practices. Uh, higher, um, highly educated Afghans in particular have struggled with skills matching. Um, for example, so those who were doctors, lawyers, engineers by training find themselves unable to work in their desired field because of professional certification requirements. And at the same time, the employment aspect of its mission is a potential win-win scenario for our country. Um, you know, you just have to look at the latest headline to know that employers are hungry for talent amid um, amidst a nationwide labor shortage. And these Afghan workers are eager to contribute. Um, and so I say this everywhere I go, if you were an American or a business that wants to support the resettlement mission, one of the most important ways you can contribute is a simple one, which is hire an Afghan. Um, and so, you know, I think that there are two major challenges that I'll sort of kind of wrap up by describing. One is the first, uh, one is the re reunification of families uh, that were separated because of the disorder of the evacuation. It's unfair to ask those who have been brought to safety to move on with their lives without their loved ones. So we must keep our promise to make these families whole again. Um, all of our clients have at least some family members who were left behind. And that absence um, is a major source of stress and anxiety. Our fear is that our clients will begin to lose hope and it would be hard to blame them because we still see such little progress in reuniting them. Um, tens of thousands of families have been forced to live oceans apart. Um, and I think that just highlights how this mission is far from over. The second is providing Afghans with the stability they would have had if they had been brought to the US through an orderly process. Um, the parole status that they have now is temporary, it's insufficient, and that's why LIRS has been working with members of Congress and urgently calling for the passage of the Afghan Adjustment Act. Um, this is the same legislative fix that refugee advocates, veterans, and faith leaders have been calling for since last year. Uh, what it would allow was um, is for Afghan evacuees to have the opportunity to apply for 
permanent residency after their first year. It would um, divert an unnecessary burden on the asylum system, which is sort of the current approach, um, which I think many of us know it's buckling under the weight of a massive case backlog um, of asylum applicants. It would also ease the strain on the special immigrant visa processing, which is also a backlogged process that takes years to complete. Um, we believe that the Afghan Adjustment Act is how we stand by those who stood with us. It is a humanitarian imperative with overwhelming bipartisan support, and there is no excuse for congressional inaction when so many lives and our nation's very reputation hang in the balance. Uh, with Congress back in session, we are making a full court press to get the AAA passed before the midterm elections, and we are always looking for people to speak with their senators and representatives. So if you want to get involved, um, really, please, I'd encourage you to reach us out. Um, let me just end by saying, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave you with this one fact. Uh, Congress has passed an Adjustment Act in every other modern U.S. wartime evacuation. Um, and that's true whether we're talking about Cubans after the rise of Castro, uh, Vietnamese and Cambo Cambodians after the fall of Saigon, um, as well as multiple generations of Iraqis following the U.S. military engagement there. Um, America uh, went to war for 20 years, the longest war in U.S. history, and our departure doesn't clear our death sheet. Promises were made by presidents of both parties and by legislators, uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle. And so now we must answer a question that becomes more urgent every day. What does an American promise mean? And so as we look back at this year, um, we believe that it is critical to keep our promises while looking forward to a future in which all are protected and welcomed through a robust uh, functioning refugee resettlement system. Um, I'm really grateful for the focus on what this year has looked like and appreciate um, the invitation to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krish. Um, let's move on into our first in-person speaker, Sadiqa Mee. Oh, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, good to be here. Um, as the team mentioned, a day after the anniversary of 9-11. Um, I would like to start by saying, um, as the other speaker mentioned, uh, the job is not done. Um, as the moderator indicated, the investment in the process that the U.S. is out of Afghanistan, uh, but Afghanistan is not out of the U.S. sphere of influence, that U.S. is still uh, uh, must pay attention on what's happening in Afghanistan uh, in terms of its the broader uh, objectives in the region. Um, I would like to put a historical context of what uh, is happening uh, with respect to U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. Um, you know, since uh, the, the primary uh, objective of the U.S. and Afghanistan during 1990s was to um, get involved, uh, support the Mujahideen, and make sure that the Soviet Union uh, is, uh, is challenged in Afghanistan. Uh, that uh, involvement, uh, significant involvement of the U.S. along with Western uh, countries and their allies, Saudi Arabia and others, um, uh, of trying to achieve an objective, a national security, uh, a strategic objective in that region, uh, which was during the Cold War, um, the, the influx of involvement uh, that uh, brought in money, brought in weapons, brought in jihadists, uh, led to a significant destruction of the institutions that were, uh, that were established, that were built in that country for, for decades. Um, and it led to the collapse of, of the subsequent governments. Uh, Afghans fully jumped on board with supporting the Western involvement uh, in the jihad against the Soviet Union. Uh, but what happened right after was the U.S. washed their hands off Afghanistan, achieving their objective of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and walked away and let Afghans uh, on their own demise. And the walking away of the U.S., uh, from Afghanistan led to a civil war uh, in that country. Uh, the, the involvement of the regional countries, 
um, uh, led to the destruction of various factions, infighting, uh, misery, migration, uh, and destruction. So that was the that was the U.S. being in 1990s, trying to achieving an objective, and then washing away their hands, saying we don't have any interest during the 1990s. And despite the fact that there were voices in Washington D.C. and different capitals from Afghans and others indicating that it's important for the U.S. to stay engaged in Afghanistan for their interests, nobody listened. And the argument put forward was that we're watching things from overseas. If anything happens, we're going to shoot some rockets from a neighboring country to dismantle any threat that's going to arise from that, that country. Uh, and they did, in fact, during the, uh, the Taliban regime in the 1990s, try to shoot some rockets, try to do some strikes. Um, but what did it, uh, did it succeed? Um, it didn't succeed. And as you all witnessed, what happened during the 9-11? Um, I would say that that was clearly uh, a failure on the part of the U.S. decision makers at the time that didn't see the threat as they should have seen at the time. Uh, that they thought that they have the capability, uh, that they, they don't have much interest. However, when Al-Qaeda attacked the U.S. on 9-11, then suddenly people realized that Afghanistan is important. Why would you, why would you do that? It's not fair for the system. It's not fair for the people in Afghanistan. It's not fair for Americans. Uh, it's, not, it's not the right way of dealing with a problem. It's not the right way of dealing with a situation. When you understand, when you see that there is an issue, there's a problematic area that is going to come after you, you need to deal with it uh, in, in, in its time. Uh, and then what we saw, right after 2001, we see a massive involvement of the U.S., an all-in approach, all of the U.S. administration, different systems, different agencies, uh, and then international community, different players involved from 2001, trying to build this estate, trying to build a viable estate in Afghanistan. I would say it wasn't a perfect approach, but it was a positive, constructive approach that led to significant achievements in the past 20 years in Afghanistan. Girls went to school, roads were built, electricity came to people's houses. People started realizing that, there is, that they have the right to vote, to elect their leaders, that they have a say on their future, uh, that there could be a positive future. I, Mukaddesa, and a number of other Afghans are a result of the U.S. involvement during the past two decades in Afghanistan. Uh, we are a direct achievement of that involvement. Despite its failures, despite its tactical errors from the beginning, from 2001, when the Bonn Conference were held uh, to bring all Afghan sides to establish an Afghan government, an interim Afghan government, the, the, the requests from the Taliban were rejected to, to make a deal, to, to make the Taliban involved in that, in that process. That was the first tactical error. And then uh, subsequent errors afterwards not investing on the institutions of the government properly, not, in, not investing on the security institutions to be built until later years, um, or trying to do piecemeal approach. Every country is specifically focused on a specific problems, not being coordinated enough, uh, not taking the Afghans' views on the ground into consideration, speaking with the warlords who did not properly represent the Afghan people, or bringing di diaspora, uh, Afghan diaspora who have been away for decades from Afghanistan and give all the keys of the administration into their hands and, and, and making them uh, make decisions that led to significant corruption in the system, the infighting that, that undermined our democracy, uh, all of those errors. But at the same time, there were significant achievements. Um, and then at the end, you know, when the decision is to, to withdraw from Afghanistan, it could have been done in a much better constructive way. There was an agreement with the Afghan government, bilateral security agreement that outlined how the U.S. forces would withdraw from Afghanistan. With giving a notification to the Afghan government, within two years, all the U.S. forces would withdraw. There was no need for the U.S. to negotiate with the Taliban. There was no need whatsoever. But the only argument that was put forward was that we are going to negotiate. We're going to use, we're going to utilize the withdrawal to speak with the Taliban Hopefully, they would speak with the Afghans, and then there could be peace. But that didn't happen.
because of the hasty decisions, getting things uh, in, in, in a way that um, things, timelines, you know, negotiate with the Taliban, agree with a timeline, and then come in on Afghans, pressure to release 5,000 Taliban prisoners for no gains whatsoever, just on the hopes that maybe they will, they will negotiate with Afghans, and then withdraw, and then the collapse. Um, and then now, what's the policy? What's the strategy? What is the U.S. doing right now? As far as I see, um, as far as everyone is a witness, it's the same policies of the 1990s. We're going to deal with the threats from afar. We killed al-Zawahiri, uh, and, and we're going to kill every al-Qaeda or every terrorist uh, in Afghanistan who's going to threaten the United States. That's not possible. It didn't happen then. It's not going to happen now. That's not the nature of threat. We, yeah, we have advanced technology. We have modernized systems, we have drones, we have surveillance systems. But the nature of the threat, the nature of the threat is complex. The nature of the threat is underground networks. The type of networks that they're operating uh, in this day and age, you cannot deal with it without having the resources on the ground to support the technology from afar. Hence, I would close my remarks saying that the right way is not going on extremes, all in, full military involvement, or just washing your hands off. Middle ground approach, diplomatic approach, try to bring Afghans on, on, on the table, try to make that peace, uh, the peace promise work that would lead to having a recognized government in Kabul that would allow the international community to be present to monitor and detect threats from Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Sadiq. Um, we'll move to our final speaker, uh, Mokhtas. Thank you, uh, Professor Ben. Good morning to everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, thank you, Dean, for being present in this conversation. Um, I'm not sure if we have Chris with us, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank her you know, for everything that she and her organization has done in the past one year um, in reserving the Afghans who were evacuated to the United States, and I and my family were one of them. But let me tell you, there's not a single morning that I wake up here and the U.S. question the presidency. I was at the airport and I had to make a decision to get into one of these flights for the safety of myself and my family. And I made that decision at that particular point of time. And I don't regret it now, of course, um, you know, given what's happening back there. And most importantly, I think I made that decision because I knew that I had to keep my voice and I had to be able to continue to advocate for the case of Afghanistan. So I'm happy that I made that decision. But again, there's not a single day that I wake up and um, I question uh, my presence here in the U.S. and, 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 and the future of my career and my profession I'm here. As grateful as I am to the safety of myself and my family and also to uh, the great the great and meaningful opportunity that I have here at the Elliott School uh, that I get to uh, turn my experience into a class and I'm very happy to see some of my students here in the audience. Uh, it has been a very meaningful experience for me. So I think and the and all of this logistics and numbers of resettlement and you know uh, the pressure of evacuation and all of that. Let's not forget the human side. Of things. And I think the human side of things is that you know, those seventy people who have been evacuated in, to the U.S. There are many like me who question their presence here. I'm given the opportunity. Um, and they guarantee that their lives are going to be safe. They are going to be back, back in the blink of an eye. That includes me. And tomorrow I have a ticket that will take me back to Kabul and guarantee my safety. Um, I would like to take that. But now, um, here are a couple of the things. Um, I, some, sometimes the way my presence makes sense to me here is to, to look at it in terms of a civil decision. I do say, you know, that if I have a ticket tomorrow, I'm going to go back to Kabul. But am I going to, you know, um, have a life there, especially as a woman? Am I going to be able to use my expertise, um, be back to the government, you know, be in a decision-making position, have the type of impact 
that I had in the past 20 years. That's, there's a big question mark on that, given what we have been observing since the return of the Taliban um, to call. Um, um, the case of Afghanistan has been reduced to a humanitarian case. Um, and humanitarian aid, as essential as it is, I have to remind you that by itself cannot elevate the problem, the, the country out of its calamity. The, there is also no quick solution to the problems in Afghanistan, options of them. But one thing we all need to keep in mind, and um, so that also, uh, you know, um, talked about that is that stability in Afghanistan will require a combination of political solution plus humanitarian. I actually think that reducing the case of Afghanistan to a humanitarian cause, again, as essential as it is, has served the Taliban because they don't have to do anything, right, to make the economy work and to generate um, commercial activity, to generate money in the economy so that people can have um, in fact, some of the conversations that we have had with government and some of our former government colleagues back home, um, the Taliban seems to think that putting food on the table is not their responsibility, it's the responsibility of the Now, that is understandable, you know, given the nature of how this group has been operating in the past 20 years. I, I did an assembly, you know, who spent a lot of my career uh, in governance and, and, and reform and making sure you know, institutions work and can deliver services uh, to the public. Both during my time of colonies for the Vienna and the Civil Service Commission, I didn't expect the Taliban, you know, to overnight take Kabul and then the next morning think about non-ideological tasks, like who's going to collect the garbage, right? Who's going to provide the electricity? How is the health care system going? And I think these are some of the very important questions that we um, all, unfortunately, um, don't tend to ask about our homes. In the a 21st century citizen of the world doesn't deserve to live under a regime like that. Um, is that sinking in uh, with everybody here? Um, how often do we ask that question? Um, I think for me, so that I don't see myself as an achievement of the U.S. in the past, of the U.S. presence. In fact, I resent that. I resent it when people would um, call women like me as gains of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. If anything, my presence here in the U.S. makes me feel like a reward of that war. And the very reason that I wake up every morning and I uh, question my being here. I think, Professor Hopkins, I agree. I, I do see myself as part of the process. You know, I do see myself as a product of the engagement there, as a product of the um, sacrifices of my family who survived through the many decades of unfortunate war in Afghanistan and uh, provided me education despite the many barriers to education back home. And also, you know, as, um, and, and, but, but equally as somebody who used those opportunities who were made available by the international presence in Afghanistan. I don't see myself as a direct or a reward of the US presence in Afghanistan. And if anything, I think going forward, um, it's important that we, Acknowledge some of the mistakes uh, that were being made in the past. I agree with my colleague um, Amin that um, back in 2001, right after 9 11, uh, the process um, of trying to create a government for Afghanistan didn't really try to take into account uh, you know, the experiences the country had in the war, but also the uh, the voices, you know, of the Afghans and the expertise of the Afghans who knew their country way better than Afghan Americans. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, going forward for the Taliban, their biggest dilemma is that the purity of their ideology, um, something that helped them win the war. 
and Afghanistan is actually now their biggest worry <coughs> because that is something that served them with their constituency, that's something that helped them recruit soldiers, and that's something that helped them win the war. But now going forward, if they're going to become lenient and they're going to back off from that and try to, you know, put together a more inclusive uh, system of governance that will allow all, um, uh, you know, aspects of the society, including their political opposition, their rivals, to be part of the system, will make it will make it tough for them to deal with their constituents, their constituency essentially. On the other hand, they're dealing with a post-war constituency. I'm saying post-war because it's post-war for them. Their fight was with the U.S. The U.S. is out now. They were victorious. So it's a post-war scenario. So they are dealing with a post-war constituency um, who are mainly urban, who have been educated, who have used uh, the opportunities that were provided to them by the aid economy. Um, if our democracy did not necessarily mirror that of the West, but I think um, more and more um, spaces were created for people to push back against the state. Um, as somebody who was in the government, I, um, I think I can um, tell you that everybody was pretty much very well aware of those spaces and very um, careful of how we engage with the public. So is that democracy in a way? I think yes, it is. But maybe we didn't necessarily have to call it democracy. Maybe it did not necessarily mirror democracy, the version of the democracy that people have in the West. But I think the fact that those spaces were, were opened up, critical debate happened, we had media. Now, there were some form of check and balances. I think it was a, it, it was a good um, reminder that some form of democracy will work in this country, despite the um, conventional wisdom, you know, that says, oh, this country is um, perhaps, you know, the values of this country does not um, work with democracy. In the past, perhaps, yes, but we all have a role. The, the world has a role. We are in the 21st century. So a citizen of the 21st century, um, does it... Um, deserve to live under a regime like the Taliban? Do women, I mean, the, 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 the crisis that's happening back home um, is the worst women rights crisis on the planet right now, uh, with what these people are doing with women on the um, Sometimes I feel like I, I see them sitting on the same tables that I used to sit and chair meetings. Um, and I see those rooms full of men um, who have no idea of what they are doing. Most of them perhaps don't even know how to read and write. Um, they think those fancy office spaces came at no cost. We were trying to build those spaces and they were waging war against us. Um, to make part of the work that I used to do at the Civil Service Commission was to make the Civil Service of Afghanistan present to have a face, you know, to have a dignified face. So part of that meant renovating office spaces, you know, having proper workspaces for everyone. So now they get to sit in these fancy um, offices that we built at the cost of our lives. Because in the past one years that I left in Afghanistan, not a single day, I had the guarantee of my life. And in the past five years, I was living out of an armored vehicle because I had huge threats on my life. Uh, but we continue to do it at the cost of our lives because we believe um, in an Afghanistan that deserves to exist in the 21st century as any other country. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, would be happy to uh, respond to any questions. But I hope my focus always when I engage on the case of Afghanistan is to be able to give an insider perspective and more importantly, a perspective that accounts for the agency of the Afghan and thinks of the Afghan person as a 21st century citizen who deserves to live in a dignified way. Yeah, thank you. That's all.
Thank you, Mukasa. So I think we have an outstanding panel which really does uh, cover the, the entire breadth of the issues from Chris's discussion about the uh, resettlement of Afghan refugees to both Sadiq and Mukasa's personal experiences as well as their uh, policy and professional perspectives on the continuing situation in Afghanistan. Um, just some quick ground rules. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. If it is to be directed at a single uh, speaker, please indicate that. And if you can just um, give your name and if you have an affiliation with any, any place, then if you can also say that. Uh, yes, Miss. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. Yeah. I am Margot. I'm from Nigeria. Yeah. You can grab that. Thank you. Margot, I am working for the UCL, so I heard your PhD. My focus is Al Qaeda. And I have three questions. So one for you, I mean, and one for you, you wish, and also for everyone. So you said, I mean, that to fight Al Qaeda and terrorism, it's good to put some resources and technology underground. Could you be more explicit about that? How do you fight the underground networks? My second question is for you, Rich. I would like to know a little bit better what do you think about the political identity of the Taliban as Afghans? And also my third question is, I have been interviewing a lot of people, Afghan, and also from different countries about Afghanistan. And the subject comes back again and again about the data, the lack of knowledge about the data, the gap of data, uh, the source that are not Trustful, could you have a word or so on this, please? And maybe share what's your experience about the data, about the lack of knowledge in Afghanistan, but also outside of Afghanistan, and about the source and what we read in the newspaper. Thank you. Well, as I stated, um, during uh, 1990, in the past 20 years, uh, there were significant presence of the US Western allies on the ground, significant networks of intelligence, um, and human resources, technological advancement, um, which I, I believe is the primary reason for what the current leaders in the United States, the president, military leaders, and others are taking credit that in the past 20 years, there was no other attack on the United States directly. Uh, since 9-11. Why? That was the primary reason was for the U.S. intelligence networks, capabilities on the ground present. That was the primary reason. Um, and those capabilities are no longer present on the ground. The capabilities of today are the capabilities of the 1990s with some advancements made on technological ground. Um, however, the threat remains. The threat is still the same threat. Um, those seeking to uh, harm the United States are still present, alive. They're still around. They're still in that part of the region. Their leader was killed in Kabul, despite the fact that the president stated in his remarks that there is no longer terrorist threats emanating from Afghanistan and that terrorist threats are now diverted in other regions. Al-Zawahiri was not found in other regions. Al-Zawahiri was found in Kabul and was killed. And this example is also being used to tell the U.S. public that we have capabilities to eliminate any threat emanating from that region. But think about it. How, for how many years were you searching and trying to find this man? Since 2001, all of the US administration was trying to find this man and eliminate him. Those resources were existing. Those capabilities, significant resources, technological resources and human resources were in pursuant of that man. And eventually, he was killed in Kabul. That similar technological resources and institutional resources 
are not pursuing every single terrorist on that region. There's, there's, there's not enough capability to do that. And so the, the reason that I'm stating is that the 20 years involvement worked in preventing and making sure that the terrorists do not have the time to breathe, to plan, to, uh, to network, and try to have a base, and to try to think, and to try to plan, and then conduct the strikes on the West. However, with now, with lack of resources on the ground, they are living in mansions right now in Kabul. They are having bases in Helman, in, in Kunar. They, they, they are openly moving around town. They're, they're speaking, they're talking, and they do understand that the U.S. is primarily relying on technology. And so it's very easy to go silent. It's very easy to plan and coordinate until the last moment. And, and, and they can easily do that. That's the nature of threats. And the only way that that threat could be eliminated is to have significant human resources on the ground, local resources on the ground, reliable partners on the ground, Afghans who speak the language, who are your allies, who would, who would find and, 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 and track these, uh, these uh, elements in Kabul. The only way to do that the only way to do that is to have a diplomatic presence on the ground. Because you can't have intelligence presence without a diplomatic presence. And the only way to have diplomatic presence on the ground is to have a legitimate, recognized government on the ground. And so the only way to have a legitimate, recognized government is for the international community to bring all Afghan stakeholders together, along with Taliban, to agree on a government, on a post-settlement Islamic government, the same government that was envisioned in the Doha agreement, which allowed the U.S. to leave. That's my recommendation. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to um, yeah, quickly answer your first question. I think I agree with everything that um, so let's say, but I also think 20 years have been long enough for the U.S., you know, to build the intelligence infrastructure. Uh, you know, everything is, is digitized now, you know. I'm pretty sure the U.S. with their 20 years of presence and also perhaps have a map of each streets at this point, you know, particularly for the provinces that I think. And that was something that I believe the U.S. intelligence community Backed on when they decided to um, get out of uh, Afghanistan, and it might work, um, especially what, what we saw with the case of Zawahi. But I think a mistake that is happening is that when the U.S. started negotiating with the Taliban, U.S. essentially assumed that the Taliban are going to serve as their partners, as their con um, counterterrorism partners, and the, that is a mistake. Because the problem is, these people are enablers of terrorism. You have to see them for who they are. They are enablers of the terrorism, the way they... Do you think they just, by chance, took over um, a country, you know, in a matter of one few weeks? Um, they have connections, both not only in the region, but with other uh, big terror networks globally. And they have to be seen for who they are. Uh, I think to count on them, uh, to think of them as a rational actor, and then to count on them as a partner um, for counterterrorism, especially given you know that what they have done in the past one year is that they have proved their incompetence on all parts, uh, not only security, which seems to be not necessarily security violence, which seems to be their area of expertise, but also in you know, in terms of governing. So I think banking on the violence expertise of a group and then rationalizing it as a counter-terrorism ally, to me, doesn't make sense. I think that's where the problem lies and that's what needs to be uh, looked into more, um, uh, you know, and more, more, more critically, because even the um, people who currently, you know, justify the ongoing limits of you know, the international community with the Taliban, they, one of the reasons that they bring in is, you know, the fact that the Taliban, I've seen many observers of Afghanistan, especially Western, especially those present 
in DC um, working in different think tank tanks, who I also have been a bit critical of them because I think they were part of pushing uh, some of the narratives that they did during the negotiations of the US or the Taliban that brought us to where we are. The same observers, think tankers, DC based, continue to push um, some of these narratives, rationalizing Taliban. Um, as an actor that could, you know, continue to uh, partner with the top, with the Americans as they come to the Somali. And I think that's a great mistake. Um, on the question of political identity, uh, the Taliban's, uh, you know, birth can be traced back to 1989, I think. So let's give a good account of how they were born, you know, right after the Mujahideen. Uh, that were backed by the U.S. They kicked out the Soviets from Afghanistan and then they got a fighting amongst themselves with led to a civil war. And that's where, out of this crisis, the Taliban was born. Um, right from they have uh, been born as a group, uh, their uh, religious ideologies have been very um, strict. I don't think they saw necessarily themselves as a political entity uh, right when they started off. Um, but clearly... Uh, I think in, during the negotiations in Doha, we managed to turn them into a political party, uh, per se. So now uh, they are clearly a part of the political reality of Afghanistan, but not the whole of it. Um, in terms of their rank and fight, they remain reflective of a slim demographic, which is mainly primarily rural young men, uneducated. Ethnically, most of them are Pashtun. And many of them have been raised in refugee camps in madrasas in Pakistan across the border um, during those early years of 1990s, uh, when for the first time Afghans actually um, had to become refugees because of the intensity of the war with the Soviet. Um, yeah, so if that answers the question um, to an extent, I think, yeah. So I, we, I, we do consider themselves, unfortunately, as part of our political reality, and they have. I think they have fought for 20 years to prove that. When you fight for 20 years, um, enraged violence, it, unfortunately, but then to make a point, I think they have made their points. Um, and, uh, and then the political process in Doha managed to turn them into a political actor. Um, so now they are the reality, but where we need to change things is that there are more realities as well in that country would deserve to be part of the political process. Thank you. Krish, I also want to give you the opportunity if you have anything to respond to that series of questions. No, I mean, candidly, uh, I'm sitting on, amongst the experts on what is happening on the ground on Afghanistan. So I learned from both of the co panelists' comments that I would not anything. Other questions from the audience? I have two questions, and they are for Sadiq. So my name is Weiki. I'm one of Professor Yuri's students this semester. So I was also part of the Operation Allies Refuge last year, and I'm also a member of the media. So it bothered me quite a lot yesterday. There was so little media coverage on Kabul on uh, Line 11 yesterday. And um, my question, I agree with you, Sadiq. The U.S. wash their hands off. And I don't think it's just the U.S. government, it is also the American public. Like I said, the media didn't pay enough attention. So for you, what do you think the American public, like ourselves in this room, and the media can do to help the government to get the attention back to the Afghan refugees and the um, policies that can help us of the uh, Afghanistan. And another question is, um, you served, I assume you served under three presidents in the um, US Embassy for the past nine years. I understand that you have the approach of um, getting a middle ground, but how do you think that could be achieved under three very different presidents and uh, different administrations? Well, uh, thank you so much. First of all, uh, let me also reiterate what Chris is doing uh, with their work and a number of other refugee agencies um, for Afghans. Um, I think, uh, despite the fact that the U.S. administration, um, you know, their priority of getting 
the U.S. service members out of the harm's way. That was a very good approach. That was positive, I think, in my uh, perspective. Um, um, but the, that process could have managed in a way, could have been managed to serve Afghans also. Um, and uh, in my uh, assessment, I think the U.S. public, um, those who have been involved, those whose sons and daughters have served in Afghanistan, those who have lost their loved ones in Afghanistan, those uh, who have had their family members maimed in Afghanistan, um, and were invested. The veterans have been invested and involved. Uh, uh, members of media, think tank, uh, today we're seeing uh, George uh, Washington University, we're seeing the Ilya School being involved. Um, a number of other academia have been involved. Uh, and I would like to say that uh, we are grateful for this attention, uh, despite the fact that uh, on the policy level, the administration is much focused on other areas of the world, like Ukraine, like Taiwan, and other places, uh, that the people are engaged, people are trying to make sure that the country that the U.S. public have invested, the U.S. institutions have invested, the service members, military and others, diplomats have invested, that that 20 years of investment do not go to waste, that we do not see a repeat of a tragic event of what we saw in 9-11. Um, and I would encourage everyone to stay involved on that and to start uh, to, to keep uh, pushing on that, to keep uh, engaging on that. Um, I, I do appreciate all the refugee agencies who are involved right now in the settlement process and trying to push this uh, Afghan Adjustment Act, which is very critical, which is very important. If, a, if, if, a, if hundreds of thousands of Afghans or 80,000 right now and the rest who are outside the United States waiting to come to the United States have lost their motherland, have lost their country, and now they're seeking the future. Um, it's the least we can do is to just give them a pathway for permanent residence status uh, and, and given their credentials, given their the, the, the way, the type of people that they are, their allies who serve the U.S. interests uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, they're going to be a great addition in the U.S. society and, and they've already proved that. Um, uh, so I would state that. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's, it's important for different institutions, different public institutions, the same way that we're doing here, is to engage Afghans. We're seeing places where they talk about Afghanistan, but there's no Afghan present to speak on Afghanistan. Uh, I think we need to change that. You know, there were times when we, we had shortage of Afghans uh, in the United States, now we have a lot of them. Uh, let's get Afghans involved on Afghan issues. Uh, let's um, uh, treat Afghanistan uh, as, as one of the one of the issues that you would speak on any other, uh, you know, uh, economy, society, and other parts. Um, uh, and engaging these Afghans who have recently arrived uh, would uh, lead to um, uh, brainstorming of ideas to eventually uh, come up with solutions, uh, indigenous solutions that would that could easily be taken up by any U.S. administration to, to address the situation on that uh, question. And, and in terms of the differences of the U.S. administration, I think uh, from what I saw in my capacity, um, uh, mostly the, 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 the policy on Afghanistan have been bipartisan uh, in the past 20 years. Um, we saw a little bit of uh, partisanship in terms of how the U.S. should withdraw. Even on the withdrawal also, you know, there was bipartisan support, but how that process should be handled, uh, a little bit of that. Uh, but at the end, as we saw, a deal that was negotiated by the Trump administration was being upheld by uh, the Biden administration, and that indicated the bipartisan uh, feel uh, on, on the way uh, things should go uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and I totally understand and I totally support that policy decision. The only thing that I would state is that changing hands from one administration to another, I think, didn't serve us well. If there was one administration, maybe it could have, they could have managed it well. Uh, but the sudden change in, in political leadership in Washington and the sudden fear that maybe if they change anything and then the process that would lead to uh, some service members losing their lives and nobody wanted to take that responsibility uh, led to uh, the decision that, that it did in the way that it did. Professor Hopkins, would you mind if I jump in for a minute? Um, yes, if you would, I completely agree with all of my colleagues' comments. I think um, just a couple points that I would add are, you know, first, we saw during the past year um, 50,000 volunteers who wanted to help specifically with the Afghan response. 
And I think that's just one small data point that highlights how engaged Americans were roughly a year ago. But obviously, you know, as was mentioned, um, the the challenge with this competitive, fast paced news um, cycle is that there are issues like Taiwan, um, you know, the invasion of Ukraine that have uh, perhaps moved the Afghan headlines um, to the margins. And I think it is critically important to push the American public to recognize first that there are, by conservative estimates, hundreds of thousands of Afghan allies and um, supporters who are still in harm's way. Um, second, that we shouldn't view this as zero sum, but I just want to note how that competitive news cycle plays out in concrete terms. So obviously with Ukrainian refugees, they have been admitted to the U.S. also through humanitarian parole. And so what we've seen is uh, both Afghans and Ukrainians admitted through the same program at different paces. Uh, so Ukrainians, we've had about 40,000 accepted under the humanitarian parole system. But with Afghans who are applying from Afghanistan to come to the U.S., they're applying through humanitarian parole, so exact same program. Only about 8,000 of those applications have been adjudicated and a jaw-dropping 96% have been de denied, um, meaning that roughly 400, um, only 400, uh, a little less than that actually, have been admitted to the U.S. And so this is where I think it is critically important um, to continue to press this issue in um, the media with the American public to say, let's pass the Afghan Adjustment Act, let's fulfill our promise and recognize that even with the military withdrawal, our mission in Afghanistan is far from over. Great, further questions? Oh, now, now it, <laughs> the dam is burst. Um, okay, can we come up here in the front end? Uh, hello, my name is Stefan. I'm a student at your World History class, Professor Hopkins. <laughs> and um, I'm directing this question a bit towards Zarish. I appreciate your personal story of coming back from Afghanistan and that personal feel to similar feel. You said that it is certainly becoming more and more possible that democracy can build in Afghanistan. And I wanted to hear more about what the progress of those building blocks of believing that you have a say in your government, say in the future. What's the progress on that? And how can the United States help um, progress that societally so that the yeah, Afghan people can start to um, come to a more um, uh, come to more freedom in their own country? If you all want to. Yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and then next yeah, time? That's, yeah. a, that's an amazing question. Thank you. So, I, um, yeah, I think it, I, a time that I don't even want to call it a democracy, you know, like that's necessarily too Western of a term and it in a way alienates uh, the, the space in a way, you know. I think it's just the human nature of one <coughs> wanting to live a free and dignified. Life. You know, some of these are the universally acknowledged values and rights of every human. Um, the progress, you know, one thing that is um, something that I always like to speak about is the um, continued stubborn presence of females on the streets of Afghanistan um, as we speak, demanding their rights. That doesn't give me their coverage here in the States. Why it doesn't give me their coverage? Because it defies the image of an Afghan woman as the poor victim. You know, in fact, I have uh, come across multiple times, I've come across people who have asked me, are you a real, real Afghan? You don't wear a scarf. You speak English, you know? And I, what's your story? I tell them, if you expect me to come from a background where my husband and my dad were beating me, and then I overcome that, and here I am today, I don't have a story. Because unfortunately, you know, the image, the only way that the world knows to engage with the Africans is the language of victim. 
And I have made it my personal mission to challenge. Um, and the very fact that you're asking this question, which is a very important question, and I'm glad you asked it, means that many out there still believe that the values of the African society is not um, compatible with the values uh, of universal values of human human rights in the 21st century. Um, you know, and I think that's where we need to question um, what we mean by democracy. Uh, what is freedom? Um, freedom for me, I think that everyone should have an indi their individual kind of freedom. Um, there was a lot of urban rural dichotomy conversations right around when the Americans were talking with the Taliban. Um, and in that process, you know, I earlier talked about these deep eating tankers who used to call women like me urban African women who don't represent the women of Afghanistan. And these were narratives that came right out of DC and then found its way to the peace process. So essentially, you know, the little bit of the leverage that we African women were pushing in terms of installing, you know, some red line. Uh, or concession lines with the Taliban so that our rights will not be entirely taken away from us, were erased from the process, essentially saying, you know, that all these um, concessions that are being asked for are by Afghan women who don't represent the real Afghan women. Uh, and this came out of DC. This came from a couple of, you know, think tankers, Americans. Um, and then, of course, it got manifested into all other parts of, you know, to, uh, to our other allies who are also who had their own think tanks and their own capitals. And, you know, it kind of like snowballed. Um, and I think some of these narratives were extremely damaging um, um, to uh, what we were trying to pursue back home. It is a traditional society. I agree. It has been affected by 50 years of conflict. Women and children already remain vulnerable to the conflict. It has torn away the fabric of our society. We haven't had systems established in an institutional way that would protect rights of women. So yes, there are a lot of challenges. Do you think it was easy for me to just emerge out of nowhere in the Afghan government and sit in a cabinet? No, it was a daily struggle. I used to tell my parents that there's a Talib, unfortunately, in every Afghan man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, you see what I'm saying is that on a daily basis, I had to chat, push so many social boundaries. And but I understood because for too long the country had gone through what it had gone that it had that there was an ecosystem of like that an ecosystem established that made it easy to not um, demand freedom and rights. Are you seeing that? Right? Yeah. yeah, but the, I think the progress that we saw in the past 20 years was that people were demanding. People suddenly saw the spaces that they could demand. And I, even when this urban rural dichotomy emerged, I used to tell people, you know, that people used to say that um, a rural woman might not want to go to school. And I used to tell them, okay, let's assume for a situation that that is right. But that also means that we are not going to make that school opportunity available in that particular province because some other woman might want to go, right? So if one rural woman does not want to go to school, which is an unfortunate scenario in itself and is a product of what we have come through as a country, instead of pushing those opportunities or to, to, the rural, to more and more rural women, we are saying one rural woman does not want to go to school, so let's not have a school out. Right. So I think it's very complicated when it comes down to that. But what makes me hope, and there are a lot of assessments right after the fall that say, you know, democracy doesn't work for us. But what I have experienced personally in that country, sitting across tables where the first 10 minutes people challenged my authority and didn't really see me, you know, as somebody deserving in that role, but then coming to a place where I fought my way to it and then, you know, by the end of it, I was the boss. Now I've become too used to being a boss, I can't go back from that. <laughs> so, you know, so I, and I saw that it's possible. So I think what keeps my, I call it my stubborn hope for Afghanistan. I think what keeps me um, 
basically hold on to that hope, as difficult as it is, is the fact that I saw it as possible. I'll leave it there. Thank you. That was fine. Maybe we can collect some questions that you have. Oh, should I send or is it? Okay. Uh, my name is Hakeem. I'm a fellow here at the Elliott School. Uh, we're grateful to have uh, Professor Hopkins here with us, who is a scholar and authority on Afghanistan's history and everything. And thank you for convening this panel. Also, I just wanted to thank our panelists for um, illuminating some of the problems. Um, and uh, for some of us, most of us are also still learning about on that part of the world. Um, I would be interested, I guess the precipit, I, I, I would say this, the, um, the deeper and, uh, and the, uh, you know, um, less deeper reasons for what happened in Afghanistan will take probably another decade to evaluate how and why. Uh, but Professor Hopkins, if you could uh, help us students and also those of us who are interested in that part of the world, if you, have an, if you could make a comment on why Afghanistan is uh, important for the United States, uh, foreign policy for the world in general, um, because the problems are, it seems to be uh, political and um, in nature, uh, and also, um, so that, I mean, if you could comment on what would be way forward um, to deal with the existing issues together, I think um, that would be nice. Thank you. Well, I will not abuse my position as moderator. I'll, I'll just um, make a comment, and that is that uh, I started off my introduction by saying that this is a war whose costs continue to accumulate. And this is something that neither American society nor I think Afghan society has really come to grips with, and that is the cost of the war. It's the most expensive war in American history, inflation adjusted. It's unpaid for, 96% of it is debt financed. Uh, there were some questions about data. Um, I mean, just the statistics that we think about, around 600,000 American troops over 20 years were stationed in Afghanistan for amongst the shortest rotations for combat ever in American history. That means about 0.2% of the American populace has been directly exposed to service in Afghanistan. It's intentional that it remains foreign, and in remaining foreign, can be forgotten. Most of the American deaths in Afghanistan were not of US military personnel, but rather were of contractors. It's about the privatization of war, because private enterprise and private violence does not have the public accountability to it that uh, would be something that we've seen in, in past examples. So I just say those as kind of contextual points that I think very much reiterate um, what our other panelists have said. Um, and also, you know, to give a shout out to, to Krish, um, I mean, Krish is and her organization, like-minded organizations, have done and continue to do amazing work that in the past, the government, the U.S. government, has fully partnered on, as she continues to call out with the uh, passage of an Afghan uh, act to bring refugees to the United States. And yet, we are in a situation where there is a collective amnesia and an intentional one uh, about Afghanistan. If, if you say Afghanistan policy circles, it's like having the A from the Scarlet Letter on your back. So I, my apologies for abusing my position as chair, and I will turn this over to our other esteemed colleagues. Thank you for the question. Um, so in order to say what's the way forward, um, we discuss where things are stand, but just to um, come back, where things are stand is that the U.S. is trying to, as Mukandasa indicated, with the hopes of getting the Taliban to cooperate on counterterrorism. Uh, the same promises that they had in the Doha Agreement, which allowed the U.S. troops to withdraw. Uh, they're trying to find a way so that uh, they could ensure the Taliban are, uh, are responsible counterterrorism partners. That's not going to happen for obvious reasons, for ideological reasons, for how the group is, is formulated and how they're operating and where they stand in terms of their whole agenda, 
uh, despite the fact that they stated in the document that they would cooperate, which was they only wanted the U.S. to get out, and they got that. So now there's no incentive for them to cut off their ties with their brethren, uh, with those who believe the same way that they do, um, um, for the sake of the United States and uh, for the sake of the people of Afghanistan or people think that maybe they, they would become responsible actors or rational. I don't think that's going to happen. Second, on a practical way, there's no way to establish, even if they say they're going to cooperate, there's no way to establish a verifiable mechanism in place um, with, a, with a group of uh, a, a group which is in charge of a country uh, where you are not you do not have anybody on the ground to monitor that. And the US government is trying to figure out a mechanism where it can happen from Doha, like from afar. How would you keep a group uh, inside the country being accountable for something? Where you're not even present, where you don't have anybody from your side to sit on the other side of the table to, to discuss and to keep them accountable to what they're going to promise. Second, they did not fulfill their promise that they're going to negotiate with other Afghans. If they are not committed and they're not fulfilling their commitment to speak with their own Afghans or Muslims, just have different viewpoints, they just want women to go to school, they just want women to be part of the government. Um, and to have other ethnic groups being represented, uh, reasonably represented in the government, and have a say in where the country will move forward, why would we have a hope that they would be speaking uh, any any sort of a commitment that they're going to have with the U.S. that they're going to fulfill? It? So that's not going to happen. Um, so as things are stand, is we have a government in Kabul, a group of people who are acting as acting government uh, in a country where nobody recognizes them. The whole world is not recognizing that group who was in charge of the country for the past one year. There are 30, 40 millions of Afghans living in that country and a number of thousands of others abroad with no future whatsoever in a limbo, while the whole world is just sitting and looking at this group and saying, we're not gonna recognize this. Okay, so what's the alternative? There are other Afghans who are willing to fight that group. There are the resistance. We're not going to support them either because we're not supporting conflict. I support that. Don't support conflict. Don't support those who fight the group. So then what are you going to do? Like just sit, sit by and just watch people, girls for a year not go to school and, and more, more years go on? Have girls, women, men not have access to medical resources, not have men, women, children, access to food, not have a future whatsoever. What is the alternative? People say, oh, we don't have any incentive. We don't have any means to pressure the Taliban to come to the negotiating table with other Afghans. I would say you do. There is resources and means available for the U.S. to pressure Taliban in Kabul to come to the negotiating table with other Afghans. And the only way that you can have that means is engaging Afghans who are outside the country. There are a significant number of Afghans, former government officials, civil society, women leaders, young leaders, hundreds and thousands of them, all in the United States, in Europe, in different bases all around the world. Engage this group of Afghans and get their views on what could be the future for the country. By engaging them, by just engaging them, you will create leverage because that is the, the status of the situation in Afghanistan is that when foreign governments start engaging Afghans abroad, no matter who is in Kabul, no matter who is in the palace, they will feel insecure. They will come rushing. They will come running towards the foreign interlocutors of what's going on. Are you guys going to work on a mechanism to replace us? And that is the way, that is the opening to make them sit with other Afghans, negotiate, Agree on a political framework that all Afghans could be represented, women could be represented, that could be a legitimate, recognized government that could uphold the international rules uh, and be part a responsible member of the international community. That's the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one final question, quick one. And this gentleman on front. Uh, no, if we can combine yours and there's a woman in the back, at least. So if we can put those short two together. Questions. Okay. Short questions. Do you want to go first? <laughs> Actually, so you have the microphone, so if you can uh, just 
Well, oh, now the microphone goes. <laughs> Thank you. I just have one question. Um, you're saying that you know international involvement is very important as it will create the process. I am rephrasing. Uh, my question: the UN, UN has a mission there. Could it be stimulated through the UN? That's number one. And number two: are there other international or world organizations in a would they be allowed to be there? Is it legally possible? Maybe a long question. Okay. And then uh, the gentleman up front, you can pass that. Um, uh, Leonard Schwartz, I teach uh, poetics at Evergreen State College and also Columbia University. My question is for uh, Dr. Vignaraja to follow up on the, I was going to ask about how the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian refugee crisis has affected the Afghan refugee crisis, and you answered that already, it's affected it. Well, you certainly gave us the numbers. Um, and I wondered if you had further analysis as to why that's the case, why uh, Ukrainian refugees are um, uh, coming in at a much higher rate than Afghan refugees in spite of the 20 year commitment we made in Afghanistan. I can imagine some of the possible answers, but I'd, I'd love to hear what, what you have to say about it because you're working on it day to day. Great, thank you. Those uh, are, are quite full questions, but if I can give each of the panelists just a, a quick moment to respond, uh, why don't we go in re reverse order and start with you, Mufessa. Thank you. Um, you know, if we haven't made you confused enough, I just wanted to say that the case of Afghanistan is a complicated case. And I think the issue of political legitimacy um, back home is an important one. I started with that saying that this should be acknowledged as a, that there should be a political solution to this and not economic and humanitarian alone by itself. The question of political legitimacy also um, remains weak. And the, the problem to that is that we as a country are an artificial construct. We, we, we were not, we are not a natural uh, born state. And, you know, in order to go into why that, you should then take my class because that's the whole class on why we are an artificial construct as, say, as a state and why the, the, the challenge of political legitimacy has been one that we have been dealing with for a very long time. And I think even today, again, we are at the same point where there is a challenge of political legitimacy and what is the process of creating a political legitimacy. Um, so I mentioned some of the ways that, you know, to engage other Afghans and the Taliban should be pushed, you know, and acknowledging all other um, aspects of the society. But one um, tricky thing that has remained throughout the history in Afghanistan is that whenever the question of political legitimacy arises, we outsource it to the foreigners. I am not pro I actually, in fact, don't even, I've noticed when I engage about the issue of Afghanistan, I don't ask for the international community help anymore. Uh, because I was too deeply involved in it to understand that some of what we are suffering right now was because of the wrong policy choices of the international community. I think I am trying to think of it more as what is it that we should do on our part as Afghans to try to find a solution for this problem that we encounter every 20 years or every other decade because when 9 11 happened we didn't have political legitimacy there was a vacuum of power we tried to solve it you know by erecting a government that was supported by the americans again legitimacy outsourced to foreign patronage and now i am not if anything i call for responsible engagement of the international community with the taliban so it doesn't hurt um further how we want to deal with I think the solution remains, and I, that could also be my concluding remarks and how I see the way forward. I think the way I see the way forward is that Afghans themselves um, need to figure out a solution to this question of political legitimacy. Uh, because it's, it has been haunting us for a very long time and we cannot outsource it to foreign patronage forever. That whoever is being supported by the foreigners because that's what happened with President Ashraf Ghani. The moment the Americans started talking with the Taliban, he lost his political legitimacy. Because his entire political legitimacy was defined by support of the U.S. China, right? So if we are going to have another international community-backed government, it, I, I'm going to guarantee 10 years down the line it's going to collapse again. So I think this requires a more critical inward 
uh, look uh, by the Afghans, that's first thing. And I think the international community should continue to play their role, but in a very responsible way. UN, um, you asked the question, has not been an effective partner. I have a lot of issues with them. I actually think they should pack up and leave because they continue to create uh, further uh, problems for the country. Um, uh, that's the other thing. I think everybody who's, who's coming there should responsibly engage and try to understand. Uh, um, the third thing that I want to say is I think the leaders are currently on the ground. I feel like I have lost the right and the agency to comment on issues of Afghanistan. Um, there is resistance on the ground, women taking into streets, men taking to streets on a daily basis, and if anybody deserves to be consulted, it's them. On multiple occasions, I have been asked you know, to come and, um, I mean, these sort of sessions, which is informative, and of course, my meaningful class that I teach here, I think is my way of contributing to this. But if anyone has the right to be consulted on how the country should move forward, it's the leaders on the ground who have stayed there, who continue to push on the face of brutal uh, violence that they're facing uh, by this uh, draconian I'm, I'm going to end it there. That's, that's all from my side. And, uh, yeah, I hope everybody was able to take something away from uh, Well, yes. Um, I tend to differ with uh, Mokadasa on whether Afghans have the capability. I, I think given um, where we are located, uh, it's the curse of geography that uh, Afghanistan's institutions, no matter what the stage of time in its history, when you look at it, uh, it has been um, prone to collapse uh, when foreign powers, when, when big powers try to uh, involve for their own interests. And we have no say whatsoever uh, on that bigger game of chess that is being played among uh, powerful players. Uh, and so that's why um, any period of uh, that you see lack of engagement from the international community, it depends where Afghanistan's situation is, for example, during uh, the came when we had four years of stability was, you know, suddenly we had a system which is kind of stable, progressive, and trying to move towards development, and nobody pays attention, no foreign power, they are engaged on their own, and so we have a period of stability which serves the people of Afghanistan. But, however, um, a reverse of that happens in the 1990s when suddenly Taliban is in charge, and then the trash communities disengage and they are among themselves, but Afghans for six years suffer under the Taliban regime. And right now we are, we are seeing a similar situation right now is the lack of international engagement, um, which is, uh, is, is negatively affecting the people of Afghanistan because there's no means whatsoever on the hands of under ordinary women protesting on the streets in Kabul to change what's happening on the ground against a group of extremists who are holding guns and are ready to shoot at anybody who is disrespecting them or disrespecting their leader or is asking for their freedom. So those women on the streets, um, of course, they're the, the future. There have to be, the, for them to have a future is for the international community to engage, to support them. Uh, and the only way that would happen is uh, opening up the political uh, pathway for them to, to have a say, for them to be involved. And of course, I do agree uh, uh, to just fix what happened in 2001 was when uh, the U.S. led process with all the international stakeholders uh, trying to bring all Afghans together. That was very constructive. What we had international engagement in the past one years were very constructive. Uh, the only thing, as I said, a tactical error at the beginning when they didn't involve the Taliban. That should be uh, fixed this time. Um, maybe the U.N. could lead, take the lead or the U.S. could take the lead. doesn't matter which country takes the lead. What is clear is that the countries in the region do not have the capability and do not have the will. The Chinese, they're only interested on economic means taking out of Afghanistan. Iranians are only interested on the water from Afghanistan and some ethnic, whatever, religious uh, interest that they have. The Pakistanis want Afghanistan to be a black hole. Central Asian countries have no capability, just want to do nothing with Afghanistan. And so unless the international community led by the United States takes the lead, nobody does anything in the region for the sake of Afghanistan. We are cursed in that part of the world the only saviors are the West and the U.S. who have been involved in the past 20 years. Given the opportunity for the people of Afghanistan to see a better life, they could do the same thing without the need to put the U.S. service members on the ground in arms way. Just diplomatic resources 
trying to organize Afghans uh, to speak with themselves and resolve the issue. Thank you. And Krish, for the final word. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So, you know, let's contextualize it. We have had about 80,000 Afghans who have resettled in the past year or so. Um, and compare that to 100,000 Ukrainians who have re relocated in half of that time. So your question of why the difference is the question that Afghans and advocates alike have been asking the administration. Um, you know, since the fall of Kabul, only about 6,000 Afghans have been admitted to the U.S. through the special immigrant visa and refugee programs. Humanitarian parole is kind of the data I just highlighted earlier in my comments. That's considered the quickest mechanism to secure short-term protection. But as I said, with Afghans, we've seen a 96% denial rate. And I think that that is obviously in stark contrast to uh, Ukrainians, where we've seen, um, if you if you take a longer time span, we've actually seen 60,000 Ukrainians who've been approved in just four months. Um, obviously, I think one reason is the president, um, President Biden, made a commitment to resettle 100,000 Ukrainian refugees, and so that was viewed as a commitment that needed to be met. Uh, the administration hasn't made a similar commitment since the evacuation, and obviously, I think that there have been other uh, you know, priorities in the administration's mind that has made uh, the Afghan resettlement effort um, secondary. And then, you know, I think a lot of critics would say, where is the equity in the system? Um, even at the southern border, while we had 20,000 Ukrainians admitted through the southern border, we had thousands of Haitians who were violently um, uh, returned um, to Mexico. And so, that I think raises just the question of why uh, the difference. Um, and, and the truth is, and I think just the final point I'll make is the broader principle has to be that America is a global humanitarian leader. We should be able to walk and chew gum. And that means having a robust refugee resettlement system and asylum system at the southern border and humanitarian parole for emergency situations where all of those fleeing for their lives are able to seek protection at our shores. Thank you. Thank you, Krish. Um, and thank you to the audience. We've come slightly over. Uh, I think it's uh, indicative of the interest in, in this topic and in particular in our speakers. I also remind you, each of our speakers has a public profile. You can follow them on Twitter. You can see their uh, writings that are up. You can take their classes. Uh, which I strongly encourage to any of you students or one of these students here at the Elliott School, um, definitely do so. And please join me in thanking our speakers for our insight and error editions today.